Well, happy Monday afternoon to you all. Um, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be going through our very first assignment called Scripture as Story Number One. And I'm going to go through the processes of what does it look like to fulfill or complete this assignment. And so I would encourage you to have your assignment open as we're walking through this and to be able to take notes. And if you have any questions, write them down, pause the video, um, put them off to the side, send me an email. And so let's connect. Um, and again, be sure to go through the video as many times as you need. I'm going to be as thorough as possible, but I also know that sometimes I miss, I may miss a few things or you may have questions about something that uh, I didn't cover or you just might be more curious about. So, so go ahead and watch this video. Um, and as you go through it, again, be sure to stop and pause whenever you need it. So let's go ahead and go through the assignment. One of the first things that you're going to do is go ahead and go over to our Moodle course. And mine's going to look a little bit different from yours, but that's okay. It's still going to be the same functionality, the same layout, same everything. So you're going to be going down to your assignments. You'll see this weekly readings here, your scripture as story number one. Um, and then what you'll do, you'll go ahead and go to this folder here, and you will see the assignment SAS1 NOAA, and then mine over here will download and go ahead and open that up. And let me go ahead, I'll need to share this again, just so you guys can take a look. And here we are. So here you are on the scripture story number one. Um, and what you're gonna be doing is going through this assignment. You'll have read Powell's article already. Um, so I do strongly encourage that before we get going on the scripture story, is reading scripture story number one, um, so you kind of get a feel for what we're going to be looking at specifically as it relates to the, um, this text that we're working on together, which is Genesis 6 through 9. So what you'll be doing, using this document as a guide, follow the steps and answer the questions. Use full sentences for your observations. Use scripture citations to support your answers. And so who are the main characters in the passage? So utilizing Paul's article. And how are they depicted? Give a description for each character. How are the characters contrasted? So what I'm looking for, who are the main characters? And give a description for each character. Um, and as we know, one of the main characters of the whole Bible, um, you can feel free to use this layout if you want to, or if you want to use your own, um, get creative with it, feel free to do so as well. It's going to be Noah. Um, it's kind of who's the main character. Also, who we know to be a main character is God obviously a big, big character, but then also um, what you're also going to see there is humanity. And as you're reading through the text, which I'll go ahead and do that with you right now, uh, I won't read all through all of it, um, but I will read a certain portion of it so we can kind of get a feel for what we're looking at. And I'm going to be reading from NRSV if you have a version that you like. I strongly encourage NRSV um, because both of its readability and the translation of it. Um, but again, if this isn't necessarily if you want something more literal, there's always NASB or NIV. So um, yeah, this NRSV is what I tend to work with. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump down to verse five. So the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings that have created people together with animals, creeping things, birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. These are the generations, the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And so I'm going to go ahead and pause it there because it does give us, a, it does give us plenty to work with there. What we see is Noah, he's just being described as righteous. If I can spell that correctly. Described as righteous, blameless in his generation, which again, we're kind of just given, describing him as the text gives him to us and described, being described as walked with God. Now, Here's what's going to be interesting, and in some cases it might get us a little uncomfortable to be able to talk like this, but it is what the text is giving to us. Um, so the way that the text is describing God, so to God, we can just say that he's, he's grieved at the state of humanity and the way that it's gone. Um, that you see quite literally there, and let me go ahead, and I do need to give scripture citations, so that's my fault. Um, so this is going to be... Um, 
I kind of know it's all out of Genesis six, not out of Genesis six, so you can go put six nine, and then again this one's going to be six nine, and then again Genesis six nine, um, six zero. That's not going to work. So six nine, and then you see at the top of the verse in chapter six, um, Lord. Uh, Lord was very sorry that he had made humankind at the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So that's going to be um, Genesis 6.6. 6, 6, 6. Uh, if I can get there, it's been a long day. 6.6. 6. Sorry that he made humanity. Yeah, that's going to be in 6.6. 6. Um, not 6 happy face. 6. 6. There you go. And you're going to just go through that process again, describing how the text um, is going back and forth between the characters. But what's also going to be important to know is after the descriptions is to how are the characters contrasted. And so what I would put for something like this, humanity begins to grieve, grieve, grieve God because of the violence the earth. Again, we're starting to see some tensions between the characters and the characters being contrast, contrasted. Well, you know what? Let me go ahead and back that up. So this is a good point, a learning point, because I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit. Humanity is, is violent and God is grieved. And again, we kind of have these characteristic traits and we see Noah is described as righteous. Again, we have these descriptions for these characters. And as you go through your silence, again, some of the descriptions you're going to have to pull out of the way that the text is describing a certain individual and their actions, because what will often happen is that the Bible won't necessarily give us a clear cut. Um, John was a very nice man. John was very cordial in his interactions with other human beings. No, that's most of the time we're not gonna get that. What we're gonna get is Moses killed a man. Moses saw the plight of the Hebrews was upset and then went and, and killed an Egyptian. But then he ran. Um, he goes and he fights um, for shepherd's daughters. And so again, we don't always get these clear cut descriptors, but what we do get are um, descriptive actions that we can start to um, see and make observations of and then see, okay, what are some of the character traits that we see in there? The most important thing, most important thing, most important thing is going to be that with a character description that if it's not um, specifically in the text and you're kind of like, well, this is what I'm seeing. I'm going to want to see some rationale that if you see um, Moses is a gentle giant. Okay, well, where in the text are you seeing that Moses is a gentle giant? Um, I'm like, well, he's very nice to these women. And I'm like, well, that's great. But what do you do about him killing this Egyptian? Um, government official. And so again, these kind of general descriptions, um, I will push back every once in a while, but again, it's really to get us to think and to see the dynamic quality of the characters that the Bible um, is demonstrating to us. Um, and so yeah, so be as descriptive as you can. If you're going to give assertions that aren't necessarily as clear cut in text, um, provide some grounds or reasoning for why you're thinking that a certain character is the way that they are. And um, so yeah, B is, I, di I didn't go into as much detail here, but this will give you an idea. Um, again, humanity, violent, and that's what we're gonna get out of, I forget the, the text specifically now. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, so that's gonna be 611, verse, um, we'll put evil inclination continually. And again, that's what that's what the text is giving us. And so there's not much, again, the, the rationale is the, the text. If, but if I were to say, um, uh, trying really hard to do the right thing, and then I'm left with, um, um, and then, okay. So if you kind of pick your verses where you're at there, but then again, that, why why is it that you're seeing this? Um, and give me a description of why um, humanity is is that kind of way. Um, if it's not apparent in the text, so 
Again, so what conflict or conflicts drive the plot of the narrative? Um, so we see God respond to the state of humanity in a certain way. And as you guys go throughout reading Genesis 1 through 3, you'll start to see that there are certain events that happen specifically in chapter 3 that do start out to let us know that something's gone awry, not everything is right in the world. And so as you're looking reading throughout this text that we see in Genesis 6, even more so like things have just gone from, yeah, it's pretty bad to now just universal. There's just something that's gone wrong altogether. And so as you work into this text, specifically in 6 through 9, um, and as you're reading throughout to look at the conflicts, the biggest one, God and humanity. That there's this conflict that humanity is violent. God is grieved. And again, we'll pull that from, um, we'll see that in 6, 6, 9, 11. Um, and so what brings resolution to the narrative? Um, God decides that he is going to start over with creation. Um, and I'll go ahead and do use my first reference afterwards um, by choosing Noah and his family. And let me go ahead and look at the verse reference for that. Um, so we have 613 there. Um, again, you don't necessarily need to put Genesis because I know this is where it's all coming from. So 613 by choosing Noah and his family. And then we go to 7-1. And so, um, and really to save time, um, because I don't want to take up too much time with this, but you're going to want to give more description. Um, what brings us, God decides to get started with creation by choosing Noah and his family. God sees that Noah is righteous in his generation. So God decides to start new with Noah. And again, it's seeing what's there and what's, what's the problem and then what's going to... Um, bring resolution to the problem because we're going to see this pattern happen a lot where you have a conflict and then you have this kind of foil that gets involved and oftentimes it will be somebody who's interacting with God and then what happens as a result of that that brings a resolution to the story and so from the narrator's perspective we're going to move on to um, question number three from the narrator's perspective uh, what seems to be a valued or important what words or themes are repeated that tell us what is important. And this is going to be really, really crucial to understand um, that if any of you were English majors or did really well in English, you'll know that the authors, they sometimes want to trick readers, but oftentimes their desire is to offer clues to readers as to how they're wanting to tell a specific story. And oftentimes the way the Bible will do that is through repetition and repeating words and phrases and ideas specifically. And so you'll want to look through the text to see if there's words that are being repeated. And what does seem to be valued is this idea of God's choosing of the righteous. That you see Noah being dubbed as righteous and you see that language. And as you're going through your reading, you'll see how that comes up again. So, um, the, I guess I decided... And what I'll say is, and preserving them. Um, righteous, repeated, however many times it comes up in the text. And again, we saw that with 6 and 9, and then we see it come up in 7 and 1, um, that God is deciding and choosing for himself a person that he will bring about new creation, which again, sounds a whole lot like gospel. But it starts all the way back here in Genesis where we see again that God choosing um, to choose individuals and work through individuals that are faithful to himself or faithful to him, not him being God. And so um, I'll just put two times here because again, to save us on some time, but this is, these are the kind of things that I'm looking for uh, in being able to identify 
um, patterns in the text for you to guys to see. And a lot of it, the authors are going to clue you in through words. If an author repeats a word, that'll let you know this is really, really important. That's good to know for this class. It's going to be important to know for BLE, any Bible class you take. And really, when you're reading anything in general, anytime you're going to have repetition, repetition equals emphasis. Repetition equals emphasis. Repetition equals emphasis. It's true in communication. It's going to be true um, here as well in the Bible because the Bible is trying to communicate a message to us. So that being said, let me go ahead and go through number four. Hopefully you guys are still tracking. As I said, um, if you guys do have any questions, let me know. Um, I'd love to be able to work with you guys. And if you have any questions, this isn't due until Sunday at midnight, um, but this is going to be kind of what we're going to be going through for a good chunk of the semester. Um, with different stories throughout the Bible. How does Noah's story build from the previous stories in Genesis, and what is the significance of the story, this story specifically, to the larger narrative thus far? So Noah's story comes right after um, Cain and Abel's story, as well as the events in Genesis 3. But, and again, I'll I'll, I'll take the position of a student, not claiming any mastery at this point, just kind of just going for it. What, I, what am I seeing and my reasoning by looking at the text and what's, what's there, letting, giving me clues as to my conclusions that I'm making. What seems to be, what's, oh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Noah's story seems to build on these narratives by highlighting the extent that the effects of what happened in Genesis 3, no story seems to build on these narratives, what happened in Genesis 3. All the world has been affected by the events that happened. Demonstrated in the worldwide, or at least with worldwide then, we'll put it, we'll put that in quotes because the world isn't as big as ours as we know now. In the worldwide, um, nature of the devastation that is reported in the story. Humanity seems to be in view as a collective whole that is that suffers from a change in a change in relationship with God and that has adversely or negatively affected the entire world and relationships with one another. Um, God's intervention through Noah and his family demonstrates God's commitment to humanity even through a flood. Because remember that God makes a covenant at the end of it. God makes a covenant with humanity and with creation promising not to destroy it, it and them with waters. Instead, God must now choose a different way to bring about restoration. Okay, 
Okay, so you wanted me to do something differently. So that's that's kind of something I would put together. Again, all this is off, just offhand and thinking through the story and how they're building up one another. But again, to think through the themes and to take the story as a whole, not just in one little segment, but really to see how does the story both build off of and then impacts um, our understanding the story so far. There's no need to say that uh, Noah is a type of Christ that's going to be coming that uh, this is foreshadowing Jesus coming because that's not that's not what we're at just yet in the story. But what does this text have to say about God's dealing with humanity up to this point? Um, and so I won't deduct points if you're at this point, if you're saying, well, the story prophesies Jesus, because again, this th that's not where we're at quite yet. And so um, so that's going to be for step um, step four. Um, and then for step three, I won't necessarily go through this whole thing, but even just reading through Genesis 8, 20 through 22, this is where God reconsiders his actions with humanity. Um, considering our world and considering your own life story, what from this passage and from the greater narrative resonates with something from your own life? So um, again, for the fact that um, God has changed his dealings with humanity and for that, um, that we know that God is faithful um, to keep his promises. We know that um, God keeps his word, and in the way that he deals with us, that he's patient, um, and that he longs for a relationship. Again, what grieves God is violence. Um, and me having grown up, in, grown up in an abusive home, um, that that, to know that that affects God in a certain way is, is oddly comforting to me, because I know that God doesn't just stand aloof, and he just, ah, well, sorry, buddy, it's, it's your cross to bear. No, that it, it, it affects God in some all right, well, hopefully that was helpful. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and send me an email or let's meet up on Zoom. Again, my office hours are Tuesdays and Thursdays from two to four o'clock on Zoom and you'll ha find that information over on Moodle. So let's get, let's get, uh, get connected and then yeah, keep working hard.